Okay. Thanks everybody for coming for this session. It has a very unyielding title. There's a setting for that, wasn't it? Somewhere, because that's how usability for site builders sometimes feels. First of all, let me give a big thank you to all the sponsors of this event, um, because I don't think I ever had as much food as I had at the speaker's dinner yesterday. And so far, the days have been really good. My name is Antje, Antje Lorch, um, IFRIC on Twitter and on, in the issue queue. And if you have any questions, tweet or use the Drupal Dev Days hashtag. I'll say a bit more about me later. So let me start with two, oh, some very bold statements. I think the site builder's user experience is really neglected in Drupal at the moment. But the good news is we're here to change that. And why? Well, first of all, I would say that as site builders and as those admins that actually can restructure their sites um, are pretty much Drupal super users. We are the ones that see every single button and every single page in a Drupal site. And also, the, the ability to restructure sites is actually one of Drupal's unique selling points. And I think we really need to, to keep that up instead of sometimes dumbing down the UI to hide things because somebody thinks they might not actually be that important. So, what is a site builder? Well, to me, a site builder is somebody who builds sites for others to use. And we are providing the user interface for other users later. It's quite often building complex sites that not only use core, but also use contrib. So, we have sometimes problems when core and contrib are kind of not consistent with each other. Um, site builders often work as part of a larger team, and we do use tools that go beyond the GUI. So, what isn't a con site builder in the context of this talk is like the somebody who wants to build a day, uh, a site in one day to just show their wedding pictures or write their personal blog. It's not the first time user, and it's also quite often not the user who has a Drupal site on a Drupal farm where they only have restricted access to certain modules they can turn on and off. So about me, well, by my own definition, I'm a site builder. Um, I've been working with Drupal since about 4.7, and I've been professionally building websites with it since Drupal 6. I mainly work as a freelancer for very small organizations or as part of smaller teams. And I'm a member of the documentation working group and the UX team. And as such, I just want to take you through um, an overview of some issues we have come across. But just a question about you. Um, who here is a site builder, by my definitions? Great. Um, who's a med module developer? Great. That's half-half. Uh, who's a designer or a themer? Oh, sure, we have something for you as well. And who thinks, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, let me start with two disclaimers. Uh, one, I think Drupal has come a long way. I mean, the fact that we don't have to configure WYSIWYG editors anymore, that we don't have installed separate modules to even have an image on the page, is quite a big step forward. And all the modules I'm going to be mentioning in this talks are modules I actually like. Um, I just want, to, want them to be better. So, if you find your module mentioned here, it's not because I think it's crap, but just because I think there's room for improvement. So, what is usability? Um, well, first of all, what's the result of bad usability? Quite often, it's a lot of frustration. It's a lot of wasted time when you go around not finding the page back or um, where you have to do unnecessary workarounds because you overlooked that there was a little tick box when you spend four hours debugging why boost doesn't work until you figured out that somebody has overwritten the comment, func the comment form in the CSS because they didn't see that there was a tick box in Drupal 7 that allowed comments or not, and therefore caching wouldn't work. But bad usability can also lead to security problems. When in order to, to make something work, we do something that creates a problem or that gives people access where they shouldn't have it, that's a result of bad usability. So, how can we make usability better? Well, first of all, I would say by actually raising the issues, so that especially module developers and coders are aware of where they are. 
And I'm also pretty much in favor of fixing all of these small little bits first, like the, the small one where one page is off, because then afterwards we can actually sit down and have a look at the bigger picture and actually trying to overhaul Drupal, Drupal 8 usability as a whole. But today we stay with the small things. So I'll give you some examples. I'll give you some simple fixes and also some ideas I have. So what makes bad usability? I'm sure you've all encountered bad usability. I've even figured out that there is actually a hash uh, attack for issues for developer usability. So quite often it's simply not finding things. It's overlooking options. It's often a lack of documentation. So you have to assume instead of knowing what a certain functionality does or what a certain word might mean. It's inconsistency in the user interface where you think you know where you are and then it's suddenly different. Um, it's also quite often hard-coded workflows or un unclear requirements. So let's start by not finding pages. For example, well, quite often you can't find a, a page because it simply hasn't got a menu item. If you look for the permissions page, anybody knows where that is? Yes, it's under people because it doesn't have a menu item, but it's not under people in configuration, it's under people there. So and that problem that has been existing for quite a while is actually something that even core contributors are still bugging. That's an issue that Catch opened, I think, two months ago, about saying, I don't really find the permissions and roles. Why are they hidden away? And actually, for most of the issues I've come across, there's actually issue numbers. So if anybody gets bored, you can already start working on them. So not, no menu items, but another problem is also that um, there isn't even a tab or a link to actually get to a page. Does anybody know where you find the Migrate UI page? It's a UI page, it's a user interface. You're expected to find it through the GUI, right? Well, actually, that link in that message that you get when you enable the module is the only time you're provided with a link to the UI page of the Migrate module. You can either remember that and try not to forget it or bookmark it, um, or you can do the usual workaround. Is you go to the routing file, in that case of the, the, migrate, well, the migrate routing YAML file, and look up where, where your pages are. But honestly, that shouldn't be the way we find our pages. And another problem of not finding pages is simply because you think there should be two pages, but in fact there's only one. Um, and this is the problem of, for example, the, if you want to have a list of the menu items, which is an issue I come across and we have actually discussed quite a lot in the last two days. So the list of the menu items, when you go to operations, well, there's edit menu, which would be the name and the description and so, or the lang language settings, and there's adding a link. Well, actually, when you go to Edit Menu, you find that the list of the menu items is on the Edit page. It's the only page in Drupal 8 where the list of the items is on the same page as the meta information or the, of the entity as such. As I said, we have an issue and we're currently discussing that. Um, Yes, there was just a remark that, yes, it was a usability improvement, except from it has created so much additional usability problems and such a non-standard solution. Um, so if you look, if you, for example, compare that to the list of taxonomy terms, you have one tab that has a list of terms and one tab that actually has a, um, the name and the description. It's a very short page, but at least it's clear where you are. It also means that's content, the list, that's configuration. So, and my fourth problem of not finding pages is when they have really generic page names. This is an issue I worked on at DrupalCon Barcelona when we had six pages in Drupal Core that were simply called settings. 
So if you write documentation and you tell your user, and then you go to the settings page, well, which one? So using the same generic um, page names is also a usability issue. We fixed this one in any case. So what can we do about this? Um, well, either we could book, write books like this on finding your admin pages through the routing YAML files, or we could ask you as module developers to actually change a few things. And that's, for example, please, please add a menu item for your admin pages. A split, split your pages between structure, configuration, and con content, which also means we can actually configure the permissions correctly for them so that my users later only need to access the pages that provide content. And don't randomly suddenly decide that this menu should actually only be displayed in, displayed in Dutch and not in English and Dutch, for example. And use proper page names. Don't call your pages list or settings. We have too many of them. So finding configuration once you're on a page. Well, quite often the configuration is unclear, information is hidden, or it's actually so hard-coded that we can't change it. And I'll just give you one example for that. If you want if you have a, tech, a vocabulary with a, few, with a few fields and actually want to say, well, the user should be able to say this taxonomy term is a child term of something else, like Milan is a city in Italy. Where on this, well, it's a bit too bright, actually. Uh, well, trying to find it on the form is quite difficult because there is one small fi collapsed field that says relations where I can actually say that should belong somewhere in a hierarchy. But I can't actually place that field anywhere. When I make a form, I can't say, this is an important field, it should be on the top, or it should be at the bottom, or actually my users shouldn't have it, because I only have a list of countries and they shouldn't be nested in each other. So in this case, somebody made an assumption, and the discussion is currently whether the assumption was that this should always be on the top or always on the bottom. But actually, that's not the module's developer's decision to make. The decision on how the form looks is my decision as a site builder. I need to provide that to the next users. So what can we do about this unclear, hidden, hard-coded workflows, um, um, functionality? Well, first of all, actually don't hard-code them. Let me actually place them or configure them as I want to and to actually get that, well, that's the one place where we really need to do usability testing. You need to see whether your users actually find things. And it's better to do that bit of usability testing than just assuming that you know how the user's gonna be using this page. Because I think across the board, if you look from very small Drupal sites to big corporation running Drupal sites, there is not one use case. We have very different needs, and we need to be able to build the sites according to that. So, a third area, naming things. Apparently, what's, that's one of the two difficult things in coding, caching and naming. Well, let's start with, the next, let's start with things that have the same name, but actually mean something very different. Does anybody know what context means? Well, give you some Drupal 7 examples. Um, a views can be a contextual filter, um, a context can be a contextual filter in views. It can be a Skald context, if you use Skald module for, for managing media, or it, or it can actually simply be the context module as a whole. So in a Drupal 7 site, you might actually end up with context used three times for three different things. So you think you've figured it out, and then it means something different. And then actually, context module doesn't provide contextual arguments that I can put into my contextual, well, that I can use as contextual arguments in views. And you spend that time wondering, like, what the hell? Why doesn't this work? And it's actually simply because all three modules just use the same word differently. The same actually also goes the other way around. You might use a different word in different modules, but actually it means the same. Again, with Skald context and, and displays viewed, viewed, viewed 
two modes, they're pretty much the same. Once you figured out what one is, you can actually understand the other one. It's just that they're called differently. And then there's my, there's another example where things are actually not named for the user to use, but for the developer or for the company or something else. Um, so one example is if you look at spam control modules, and this is from the ex extent page. So you find that capture is grouped under spam control. Does anybody know where molum for spam control, in which group that is? Any guesses? Well, it's listed under Acquia. Now, honestly, as a site builder or as a user, I don't need to know which company has developed this module. I need to know what it does. So, whoop. so what can we do about this? Well, first of all, check what other modules are doing. See whether other, other modules are already using the word you like to use or whether they're actually doing something similar and you could use this, the same vocabulary. And strive for consistency beyond your own module. Because as a module developer, you might work with one or a few modules. As a site builder, I work with lots of modules. I need to make the bridge between all of these. And if you as a developer look out and help us with that, I think we all just waste way less time. And then, yes, name the things for the user. And if halfway through you find out that the name you've chosen isn't so good, either refactor it and name it completely, di name it different, or use the old name. Don't you? Don't do both, because that's something also sometimes find that sometimes the wording has changed halfway along the module. And that brings me that brings me to one of the ideas I have and something I would like to see. And that would basically be a glossary file. A glossary YAML file where per module we simply define the most relevant terms and display them in the Drupal site. That would mean that the the module uh, that the site builder actually has all the terms they need at hand. That's I don't if I don't use context module, I don't need to know how context defines context. But if I use it, it's good to know that these different modules actually determine a certain, uh, define a certain word in this way or the other. So at least it's not me not understanding it. It's just the word being used different. We had looked at the glossary, for example, on Drupal.org, which has something like 400 terms and doesn't get updated and certainly doesn't get updated with all the contract modules. But if we could actually per module just add these few lines of defining the main terms that would go a long way in actually understanding, I think. So this brings me again to consistency. If you, for example, look at lists of different content types in, in Drupal 8, you find that this is a, an image of the content types. So you have a name, description, and operations. That's pretty straightforward, I think. Uh, you have a similar thing for comment types. It's not called name there, it's called comment type, but also has description and operations. And you see that the media module is also taking that up, name, description, operation. But when you come to vocabularies, it just looks like this. Vocabulary name, operations. There is a field for a description of a vocabulary that isn't displayed anywhere on a Drupal site. I'm not quite sure why it's there, but if it's there, I expect it to be there so that I can later say, this, this vocabulary is intended for this or that. So, again, what can we do about this? Um, I think it's really good to actually simply follow standards when they are there, and only to divert from those standards when there's a really good reason. Like, is there a good reason why the vocabulary description is not displayed? Maybe there is, but I haven't come across it. And I think we should also actually develop and promote UI standards. Now, if you look on, if you develop a module, you find there are coding standards. I'm sure there's going to be long discussions to have on how much, how much characters a line of code should be. But it's somehow de decided that it's going to be 80 characters 
An inland is two spaces, not a tab, not four. 80 characters, two spaces, and that's the standard we use for coding. And I think we should have similar standards also for UI text. We have 80 characters for code, but we have no information on how long a description on the modules page can be before it breaks off. And I think that's the kind of standards we can actually develop already from what we currently have. There's a few things in there that, um, that we have for help text, but I think also some general lines on what should a module description look like? What kind of information should go on the admin page? I think we can work on and provide some templates that make it easier to un understand where to expect what. Which brings me to documentation. Well, quite often the main problem is simply that there is no documentation. Um, this is an example from the paragraphs module as it looked about two weeks ago. That's the full documentation on the help page at that stage. It simply said about paragraphs. Great. I know this module is about paragraphs. And um, we have actually worked on that. Um, I made an issue and um, the, the maintainers were quite happy to actually get all of that in. So now you have an actual help page that also in includes kind of hidden functionality like that there's a page for preparing the module to be uninstalled, which is something you wouldn't quite come across. And then sometimes there, there's documentation, but it's kind of in the wrong place. And these are some examples from, from Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, actually. Um, like the blocks module on the description page actually explain, explains you what modules are. That's a, that's a bigger context, bigger concept that shouldn't really be explained there, let alone when it starts breaking off. Um, the database search default actually gives you information on how un to uninstall the module on the install page. Useful information, but not quite there. And the rules module in 7 gives you a rough explanation of what rules does, but too short to actually understand it, if you don't understand the concept yet. It has a link to the online documentation on the admin page, where it shouldn't be. So either you understand it, then the text is too long, or you don't, and the text is too short. So to delve a bit more into that, and this is where my previous life as a scientific editor comes in, we basically have kind of three different types of help in a module. The one is actually to, to understand the concept of a module, what a module does. If things are good, you only need to read that once. And therefore, that can be on the help page or on a documentation page somewhere else. Then there's information you need a few times as a reminder on what was this actually for, what did I need to fill in where. That's the kind of help that can go on the admin page. The kind of two or three lines that just, when you haven't used the module for a few weeks or a few months, just gives you a quick reminder on, ah, this is how things worked. And then the actual stuff like field labels, field help, that tells you which characters you can input, or things like that, or even with what the tick box was for. So that's different, basically three different levels of help. And based on that, we can actually um, sort out help per module actually much more better than it's currently spread out all over the place. So what can you do about this again? Well, first of all, document your modules into functionality. It's a bit of everybody's time wasted if there's great functionality, but we don't know it exists, and we work around it, or we get other modules to do the same thing. Um, write your help texts. Actually, there is a, there is a page on Drupal.org that gives you information about how help text should be. And quite often, it's also simply reduce the help text that is there. Quite often, it's simply so long that it stays unread and doesn't help you either. Of course, we have one problem, and that is that um, the help text is only available after you've installed the module. And in Drupal 8, that's getting even a bit more scary when you kind of initially install a module just to read the help text and you uninstall it and says, do you want to remove all of this, this configuration? It's like, mm, probably. I don't know, I haven't actually used this module yet, so probably, but... Um, so, 
there has been an idea to move some of the help text into YAML files because they could be read independently of the help module. However, then that would be available before the module is installed. But unfortunately, we couldn't have any dynamic links in there. So that's an idea to be discussed further on how we can make help pages available before the module has been installed. Or how we can also export help pages to something where Google will find them. And then there's another very simple idea I had, and that's, could we add simply the Drush commands on admin pages? Because lots of modules provide Drush commands to actually do the same functionality, do it much faster from the command line. But to find them, you have to go on the command line and do Drush hyphen hyphen help or to go to drushcommands.com. But maybe it would simply be possible if we have a, a wording that says, you, instead of clicking this button, you can also use this and this command. It would have, the, would have the advantage that it would be much easier for site builders to progress from using the GUI to using Drush commands. Because when you're in the middle of building something, it's quite often the, ah, I just click this button anyway. I know there's probably a command, but at the moment I don't have the time to go looking for it. But if, if it would be provided to me simply in the help text on the admin page, that would be great. So, so to summarize all of that, um, well, there's lots of improvement that modules can actually make with these existing tools, like making sure there's menu items, check with the naming, um, all of those kind of things. And paying attention to what other modules does, I think is a key element. Look and, yeah, pay, pay attention to the naming. And then all together, if we can develop some user interface standards instead of changing something here or there, like the example previously with the menu items, that was because user testing had found a problem here, so we've changed it here, but then it's different than there. And we, but there isn't an overarching picture of how should this be done. And then, of course, work on usability issues. There is a usability team that um, now also has a separate page where we just pull in all the issues that are tagged with usability. It's on Drupal, drupalux.org. Um, and of course, there's few of us upstairs in the sprint room that work on usability issues. So you're more than welcome to help us doing this. These were the issues that I did mention, in case anybody wants to jump in and work on some of them. And that's my short summary for now. Any questions, ideas, proposals? Uh, yeah, the question was whether we would need a style guide for Drupal admin pages. Yes, I think that's part of the both. How should it look like? Because we spent a lot of time on how should the buttons look like to make sure there's three types of buttons. Um, but there's little attention paid to the actual wording, for example. So we have some buttons that say save, save configuration, save settings, save block set permissions. And you wonder, is there a difference between saving, permission, uh, saving settings and saving configuration? Actually, it's not. Actually, we are not even supposed to use configuration. Uh, sorry, we're not supposed to use settings. Um, but that kind of information is hidden away on a very long page on Drupal.org somewhere. So yes, a style guide that includes both the visual elements as well as the wording is something that we really need, need to work on. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, just being what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the question was whether all the pages with page settings are like the pages, the page titles, the URL, or it's also the primary tabs that you have on a page. Um, so what we did in this one issue is an, at least to make sure that the page title will say, for example, aggregation settings, even if the tab says settings. 
but there also is a there's no clear line at the moment in how page titles and primary tabs relate to each other whether they should say the same or not or uh, because then you have a duplication so there is no pattern at all at the moment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, the proposal was that the help pages should simply be duplicated on Drupal.org. Um, yes, that, that is one of the, the good things to do. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, there's one problem with um, the, and that works for, um, for contrib modules. There it's easy to get to the documentation. Documentation for core modules is a bit more complicated because they're all somewhere part of drupal.org project drupal all the 60 modules are in that so it's it's not possible at the moment to say i want to go to the taxonomy module because that's hidden in drupal core um, one other problem is also that uh, the help texts as they are in core have actually been reviewed and are in version control they are in Git because Drupal is in Git. Um, changes on Drupal.org can can be made on the site. Um, and, and the other thing is what's in core is actually translated in different languages. Um, what's on Drupal.org isn't. But yes, if we could actually have pages that simply pull out the help text and put them on a page, that would be really great. Unfortunately, the DA um, currently doesn't have any capacity to do any improvements like that on Drupal.org, so we're a bit stuck on that front. Maybe we just create, like, <laughs> there is actually um, the proposal was maybe we need Drupal help. Well, that's what Drupal documentation is supposed to be for. Um, however, there is also one contrib module that's currently. Um, nearly finished, and that's actually the Drupal 8 user guide that explains a lot of this, the, how the modules work, how the concepts work, that is also reviewed and edited, and changes to that cannot be randomly made, but have to actually be committed. Mm -hmm. um, the question was whether um, module developers actually should get this list of suggestions on what they should do or could do. Um, yes, actually, I really would like to, just as we have the list of coding standards, where there is a section for naming convention for functions, I also want a naming conventions for field labels, for example. Because some fields, like sometimes you have the same field that's called description or administrative summary or so. Um, but if we could actually provide some of this kind of um, line, uh, lengths of text for certain things, um, naming conventions for field labels and help text, they should actually also go together with the coding standards. Because at least I hope that's where lots of people are looking for, to find out how many characters their code should have or, or a line of code should have. So yes, I think that would be the place. Yeah, so the question was, there's also the readme text, which also needs to be added and quite often is separate. Um, and I've seen also contrib modules where the only information is in the readme text, uh, which is good because, well, that's where I can find it. But lots of other site builders um, quite often don't actually have access to the command line. Certainly not sites um, that are in a, in a Drupal farm or so. We just can't get to, you can't get to the readme file. So, but yes, I think finding a way that we can have certain information 
combined and not writing the same text three times, four times, um, and then writing additional blog posts about how your module works. I think if we can streamline that a bit, then we don't need to spend so much time. And then also when the functionality changes, it's less time needed to actually update that. I think that was a, quite a good plea for also a bit more standardization of documentation. An example was that sometimes the readme file is more like a promotion file for your module, saying this is great, it does this and that and that, but actually not telling you how it does that. And for some modules, yes, you are required to actually read the code to figure out how it works. Um, so yes, if, I think if we can agree on some, some more standards um, and also actually put the time in writing them, because there's a great, it's great to have a standard, but um, if the help text just consists out of one word because it needs to be there, because otherwise it fails the test, um, then that's not really do, fulfilling its purpose. Um, there's a question whether there's a time to work on usability issues. Um, no, um, whatever time I'll get up and come here, um, I'll be in the sprint room. Um, there's some other people, um, and if you look for issues that are tagged with usability, or especially usability at Dev Days Milan, um, there's, we're trying to make lots of kind of small issues that can also be fixed in a day or two. Um, however, people are taking them up faster than we can do them sometimes, so... But no, if you, if you come up and if you want something to work on, I'm sure we can find something. Um, there definitely is enough to do. <coughs> Any other questions? Everybody else finding it way too warm here and slowly slowing down? <laughs> Oxygen has not been provided. <laughs> okay, well, thanks everybody for coming. And, yeah.